In this episode, I talked to an engineer who spent 30 years building her own consulting firm before it was acquired by a larger organization, which she is now a VP for. Trudy Williams has just had an amazing career, and I can't wait to share with you three themes from her career that I believe can help any engineer be a successful leader. Before we dive in with Trudy, a word from our sponsor, PPI, a leader in exam prep for the FE and PE exams since 1975. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. All right, now I'd like to welcome our guest onto the show today. I'm excited that I have with me here Trudy Williams. Trudy is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Florida. She's also a VP with Consor. Trudy, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thank you. So Trudy, you've had a successful career in the world of civil engineering for some time. Tell our listeners, give them a couple of minute overview of your career in terms of how you, you know, from the business to where you are today. Okay. Well, I actually started... um, engineering 10 years after I graduated from high school because I took a medical route first and then went to engineering school at University of Florida and FIU, Florida International University here in Florida and with a degree in water and wastewater treatment and structural engineering. So I worked for a couple of firms over the seven years before I started TKW. Uh, TKW are actually my initials, but I told people it was three dead guys. So um, <laughs> We, um, I started my engineering firm in 1989, um, just doing water and wastewater treatment and permit renewals. I hired, we, we grew to about five or six people. Um, we moved, I hired a water wastewater engineer that also happened to be a licensed structural engineer. And so our structural engineering department took off. And Florida is a great place to do business in, in water and wastewater engineering as well as structural and, and civil engineering. Um, in, nine, in 1999, uh, Governor Bush, and you know, I, I'd never met him before and wasn't a big contributor to anything, um, appointed me to the South Florida Water Management District Governing Board. And that was the, um, the entity responsible for restoring the Florida Everglades. And after that, um, I ran for the Florida House of Representatives and um, served for eight years because here in Florida, we get turned out after eight years, which is a very good thing. And uh, continued on, on my career. So after 30 years, uh, sold to Consor in 2019 and their venture capital group back behind you, know, back by a venture capital group. And um, things have been great. That's great. You wow. have the same group of people and, and all that. So it's, it's been nice. Wow. Great. What a career that uh, Trudy just kind of recaps for us for in a few minutes. And, you know, just so I can kind of recap that a little bit, because that's something that you said sounds fascinating to me. So after college or I think you said college or high school, you went a period of time where you were in the medical field and therefore you didn't get right into engineering then you got into engineering you maybe worked with a couple of companies and then decided to start your own company which to me certainly sounds like it you had confidence to be able to do something like that because you know I'm, I'm, i don't know how long you were in the field of engineering but i think starting a business is something that is not easy to do um i graduated from engineering school in 1981 and i started tkw in 1989 so now what made you want to start your own business I was working for a firm that wasn't very, um, what I would call, it wasn't very honest and didn't have a lot of integrity. And I just didn't want to be associated with that. I was talking to a friend at lunch who was also an engineer. um, And he said, well, Trudy, why don't you just start your own company? And I was like, I can't start my own company. I don't know anything about it. And he goes, you'd be surprised at how much you know. So I went home after lunch. It was on a Friday. And told my husband I was going to start my own firm. And he asked me who I had lunch with. And I said, I had lunch with Bob. And he goes, were you guys drinking? <laughs> so, um, and, and the rest is history. Started, you know, just 
in, changed my family room into a little office, had a laptop that looked like a sewing machine, one of those uh, DOS operating systems. And I know people don't even know what Fortran is anymore. So, um, and here we are. Wow. That's exciting. And I actually took Fortran in college, so I know what that is, but I don't know if the audience does. Um, but that's awesome. I mean, I think that the first big step for an entrepreneur in a lot of ways is making the first commitment to start a business. And it's exciting that you did that with a lot. Obviously, there was certainly, I'm sure there was a lot of risk you were facing, things that were uncertain, but you know, you took a chance on it, which is great. So <clears throat> let's talk about that a little bit, because I found that one of the most important aspects of being successful as an engineering leader, whether you have your own business or you're working for a large corporation or a small company, whatever the case may be, is the ability to develop your leadership skills, your soft skills, your communication skills, right? Things that we don't get taught in school as engineering professionals. Exactly. So tell me how you were able to start your business and then learn and develop those skills. Well, um, the first thing I, I did uh, probably a year after starting my own firm is I needed to get more plugged into the community. Um, if I was going to do work for the municipality or the cities, I needed to know the people there. So I joined, joined Rotary International, and it's a one, one day a week breakfast meeting, Did, still doing that, and um, made sure I was in the club downtown Fort Myers, where most of the attorneys and engineers were, and um, made contacts from that. Then I also um, volunteered for the American Red Cross. And that puts you, that gives you a whole different volunteer dimension, served on their board for a while. Um, it, you, you just, you develop friends and acquaintances through volunteering and through service organizations like Rotary, for instance. And that proved to be very, very helpful. Still am involved in Rotary, I'm no longer involved in um, American Red Cross, but I do serve on the um, Hope Hospice Board of Directors now, and on a private school um, board of trustees. So I still keep try to keep plugged in as much as I can in the community um, because that's how you get referrals. That's how you. That's how you. You know, make. And, and I always try to hire people way more. I was going to say way more better, but way way more intelligent than I am in the field of engineering, and that has been hugely successful. I'm a people person. And I've always hired very bright engineers, and it's been and it's been the best thing I could have ever done. I've never been intimidated by any of my employees' intelligence. I just was maybe wowed by them more than anything. That's great, and I really love the the fact that you, even early on in your business, where you probably had a lot of things going on, a lot of things to try to figure out, you spent a lot of time getting involved with these organizations. I know. Well, well, when you when you start a business, you're not busy 40 hours a day because you don't have the client base. So you have the time to immerse yourself in in these others trying to trying to get your client base. I had worked in engineering before, but not water and wastewater engineering. I had worked for a civil firm, so I had to ask those clients if they had you know any water or wastewater needs. So um, immersing yourself early early on when you do have the time is is, is a great opportunity. So I want to ask you a few more questions about the sure. idea of volunteering and getting involved with associations or service organizations, because I feel like that's always advice that people give to engineers. I've heard a lot, you know, get involved, get active, join associations. But I feel like <clears throat> one thing is to join them. Another thing is to be active in them and take an active role. So I'd love to hear from you about how, when you said get immersed, like what exactly, once you got involved with these organizations, were you on leadership positions? How did you make the most out of those organizations? Um, well, yes. I mean, you, you, you immerse yourself in them. You, you know, um, Rotary isn't just about a breakfast meeting every, every Wednesday morning. It's about, um, you know, raising money for hospice, raising money for different organizations that your group cares about, um, sending money to, to, for instance, I know that um, Rotary was instrumental in doing away with um, polio over um, in the third world countries by their, by their donations. So um, always, you know, if there are extra activities other than your morning breakfast, make sure you get involved in those because that also increases your circle of influence. That's great. 
one of the things you said to me before we, you know, offline, before we started the interview was that you really early on in your career, you wanted to be a sponge. Talk about that. Oh yeah. Um, well, the same thing when I was in the Florida legislature, you know, you just, you don't talk, you just listen and you listen to people like who are far more intelligent than you, especially if you're green and just coming out of school. I mean, you might know that you don't, you still don't have the, the people skills. I don't believe when I, I certainly didn't when I got out of college. So I, I listened intently on everything that was being done around me, whether it was from the business office to the surveying department, to the engineering department, I just wanted to learn from them as much as I possibly could because I, I was book smart, but you know, I wouldn't have known a manhole if I fell into it. So, um, and, and the same is true for my um, legislative years. First year, I mean, I didn't know anything about the legislature or I just, just listened attentively for a whole year and to see what people were doing and how they were poised and you know what I knew what my interests were but I sure didn't stand up in in um, the uh, legislature and raise my microphone wanting to be you know wanting to be called upon so um, it's, it's just really important that for however long you're until until you're comfortable or actually you need to get out of your comfort zone but you need to make like a sponge and learn as much as you can in, in a shorter period of time and um since I was in the water and wastewater, I made sure that I went and visited the plants and talked not only to the owners, because they didn't know much of anything, but to the wastewater treatment plant operators and water plant operators, because they're the people with the knowledge. So Interesting. So it sounds to me like kind of a running theme of this conversation from what I'm hearing from you is an important aspect of growing your career as an engineer is surrounding yourself with the right people and then listening to those people, whether it's the people that work for you, whether it's the people in these treatment plants, whether it's the people in the legislature, it's really not being, you know, not being of the mindset of, I kind of know a lot of stuff, but more of, I need to learn from as many people as I can. We got the book smart. So now you got to get the street smarts, you know? So. All right. That's great. I think it's a great philosophy. And I think oftentimes what happens is as we grow in our careers, Maybe we feel like we're starting to learn stuff and we do less of the outside stuff, whether it's less of engaging with people, less of surrounding us with the people that can really help us grow. <clears throat> and I do think that that's a really important aspect of one's growth. And, and so I'm glad you, you mentioned that a few times here. And so let's talk a little bit about the business um, in terms of, you know, you were doing it for a long time. It sounds like you had the business for maybe 30 years or so Correct. before you sold the business. So how does one maintain the, I guess you could call it the fire, you know, the desire to do this on a daily basis for 30 years, you know, what kept you going at it for 30 years? I love what I do. I love the people I work with. It, it was just, it was fascinating to me. And the, the more I grew, the less engineering I did and the more um, marketing or, you know, people stuff I, I did. I think one of the greatest eye awakening things that I did five years into owning TKW is I don't know if you have this in New Jersey, but it was something called leadership Lee County. And it's done through the chambers, Florida chamber and um, Southwest Florida chamber. And it's like one day a week for six months. And it takes you to like the jails. It takes you to the sheriff's office. It takes you to medical offices and it takes you to soup kitchens, things that you probably have in your community that you've never seen before. And that was life changing for me. Um, just that I, you know, I'm sitting up here in an ivory tower surrounded by very bright people and you don't see what's going on in your backyard. And I think people really also should, should, should do that. Like you said, you sit in your office all day and you don't see the outside. So. It's a great point. And I know I grew up in actually New York and in, in Rockland County and I went through a leadership Rockland program that they had similar type of program. I have right. a friend a civil engineer I just spoke to not too long ago in Austin, Texas. He went through Leadership Austin. So I think they have these programs across the country right. yeah. and they are excellent programs in that they can plug you into your community. And quite frankly, I think as a civil engineering professional, it, it's probably one of the most important professions to be plugged into your community because as civil engineers, we serve the community. I mean, oh, right absolutely. down to the water they're drinking, to the roads they're driving on. Everything about what we do is plugged into people. And so for us to understand them and to talk with them, in fact, we were doing a training this morning for a company on communication. And one of the things that I talked about is communicating with kind of the end users of your projects, right? If you're doing a roadway 
if you're doing a park, if you could talk to the people that are going to use that park or that drive on that roadway, you're going to get amazing information that you can use in your designs. Just like Trudy said earlier, she would talk with the wastewater treatment plant operator to understand, you know, really get in the insides of that. So I think that there's some <clears throat> real value in being super plugged into your community as a civil engineering professional, understanding what goes into different aspects of the community, because ultimately your job more or less is to improve your community on a regular basis through the work that you do. And I think that's so important. And Trudy, it sounds like for you, and I think this is important because I'm sure a lot of our listeners feel like this. I know a lot of us as engineers, sounds like me and you kind of like the people side of it a lot more than the calculations and the reports and things of that nature. Totally. So, so it definitely sounds like there are great avenues for people in engineering. If you're like that, you don't have to leave right. engineering. You can just take on a different role in engineering where you get to do the people stuff. Well, you know, and then I have engineers who would just as soon not see anybody all day long. And if you fed them that if they could feed the drawings under the door to you and you'd feed them the paycheck under the door back to them, they'd be happy as can be and never have any interaction with anybody. I'm not wired that way. Um, but a lot of my engineers that work here are that way. And you, you got to respect them because they're really, really good at what they do. They might not have people skills, but not everybody has those. That's so. great. And, and, and to me, that's another really important point that any engineering leader needs to remember is that you're going to need to build a team to be effective and you're going to need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each person on that team. So if you have people that are highly um, have, have high expertise in a certain technical component, you're obviously going to want to focus them in that area. If you have other people that are really good with communicating with clients, you're going to want to make sure that they're in front of the clients. If you have someone that's really good at presenting in front of a border agency, you right. want to make sure that they're up in front of the border agency. So I think that that's a critical part of leadership is building the right team and making sure the people on your team are doing the right things. And even yourself, if you're not comfortable doing something, you don't enjoy some, doing something, you're not going to want to do it we're going to right. want to try to get into something else, which is, I think, Trudy has given us the perfect example of in her career. So, like I've seen, I've seen with other firms I work with, where um, the best engineers are put in management, and they're totally lost. I mean, they don't want to manage people; they want to manage their projects, not people. And we have to respect that because we need people like that. You know, and I think that that's a challenge in the world today, in some consulting firms and. And the reason I say that is because some consulting firms have these pathways kind of worked out in their, in their um, corporate ladders, the progression of how people go. And sometimes I've talked to a lot of engineers, for example, that are technically proficient and they really just want to do calculations for their entire career, but their company is pushing them into the management track or the management pathway. They don't want to go. And they don't want to go. And I think it's, and you don't want to force someone to do that because they're not going to be a good manager and you need people that are good technical too. So I think any company that's charting out different career paths, you need to say to yourself, we need to have an option for people that are highly skilled on the technical side of things and want to stay doing that work. And people that are want to get into management, want to go down the management road. But I do also think that there should be, if you offer partnership or ownership opportunities in your firm, they shouldn't be only for the people that are good at management. Because I think that right. that's, causes a little bit of a challenge in our industry because people feel like if I don't go down the management road, I can't be a partner. I can't be an owner in the firm. And I don't think you're creating, setting yourself up for success when you do that. Cause we need people that are super, super technical and really experts. And we need people that can communicate their expertise to the community essentially. Yeah. I know somebody that got promoted through that, that management um, ladder. And I talked to him and I said, so how are you enjoying your new management position? He goes, living the dream, one nightmare at a time. He hated it. <laughs> yeah, and that's not the culture that you want to breed, certainly. Right. So, so that course, wasn't my firm, but it was, it, was a, it was a national firm. So, yeah, I think it happens all the time. And so a couple of just a couple of key takeaways here from the conversation with Trudy. I think number one, definitely being a sponge in your career. And I don't want to just say early in your career. I think being a sponge your entire career. And I think Trudy's Absolutely. a good example of that. She says that she's still doing it today, essentially. Um, learning from other people is very important. Secondly, getting involved in volunteer and service organizations. And, you know, we say this a lot on the podcast, and I'm not just referring necessarily to like the ASCE or NSPE um, or these types of organizations. I'm also referring to, as Trudy said, community organizations like a Rotary right? Like a, uh, an organization where you can give back, like a soup kitchen, like a Red Cross, something of that nature can really be beneficial for one in your career. That's a, that's a really big takeaway. 
And I think the other takeaway is understanding how to build teams, understanding that you need people that are good at different things and not forcing people to do something that they don't, and not forcing a highly technical person to go down a management path. I think those are three amazing pieces of advice that you can leverage in your career. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. We're still going to come back with Trudy because I want to ask her a couple of last career questions. We're going to put her on the civil engineering hot seat. We'll be right back. All right, we're back with Trudy Williams. Trudy is a VP with Consor. She built her own firm for about 30 years and it was acquired by Consor. She's a licensed professional engineer in the state of Florida. She's given us some great advice today on how to go through one's career, how to help grow a business, how to be a successful manager and build a team. But now, Trudy, I'm going to put you on the civil engineering hot seat. You ready? Okay. All right. First question, Trudy, do you have any specific rituals that you practice every day, maybe a morning routine, a lunchtime routine, something you do every day that has contributed to your success? Probably not every day. Um, late in the last two years, I've done a 6 a.m. Pilates class every morning. Um, earlier on in my career, I made sure I got tried to get out of the office at four and um, play tennis uh, almost daily. I, well, at least every other day um, until I had some surgeries done. But that, I mean, that also is, you got to have a stress relief. And if you can, I used to get, if I got mad at somebody say at the county that was re reviewing my drawings or something, I'd paint their face, put a smiley face on my tennis ball and you'd, you'd be amazed at how well my serve got. So, um, you know, just any, you have to, you have to, you have to get stress relief somehow. And of course, I, I'm big into, into prayer, so. Okay, great. So building different ways to relieve stress in your life is certainly beneficial. I think, I think more than ever now, based on everything that's happened over the last few years where people couldn't go out, couldn't be around other people and things of that nature. So I definitely think that that's a great piece of advice. Second question, do you have a, a book that you've read in your career that stood out for you that you've used over and over the principles you shared it with people something that stood out from from good to great Tim Collins yeah okay, good to so, great. yep I mean just just the first chapter tells you everything tell if if somebody's not working out for you just get them off the bus you know and those are a lot of us don't really want to do that you know so it, no that was a that was a great I refer back to that and I get copies to, to all my engineers. That's great. Yeah. And that, that is a book that many people have answered that question with. So good to hear that. All right. Another question I have for you is if you think back upon your career, <clears throat> maybe for you, it was more before you started your business, you had managers at, at other companies that maybe you worked for. And, and obviously I'm not asking to name names, but what I'm trying to understand is what was it, that made you like a manager? What is a manager in engineering? What makes for a good manager in engineering that makes them, someone want to work for them, someone want to really hit goals for them? What, in your opinion, what makes for a great manager in the world of civil engineering? Um, calm, temperament. Um, you're basically an orchestra leader and you got to keep a cool head. I mean, I've worked for people that would call me up screaming. It was like, you know, you know, I'd say good morning and they'd yell at me and I was like, well, it's not good morning anymore. So, you know, just don't put up with that kind of nonsense. I don't, we don't allow swearing in the office, never have. Um, have a pleasant work environment, do things with your employees and their families. You know, we do picnic twice a year. Of course, we're in Florida, we can do that. Um, with the families and, and, you know, at a local park here, we always try to stay engaged with with our employees because after all they spend as much time with us as they do at home with their families and we want it to make it a very comfortable working environment and treat them like family that's great yeah, treat I mean, them with respect for sure that's great and it seems like you know the more we talk the more evident it is of how much of a people person you are you know whether it's getting involved in these volunteer organizations or getting involved with your staff and doing things with their family so it's great to hear that that's definitely a running theme for you, uh, for sure. But so I had a boss that used to yell at me all the time. And so that taught me that uh, if I ever own a company or have stature in a company, I will never, ever treat my employees like that. So, I mean, that was a life lesson. 
Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it's really tough in the moment when you're experiencing it, but if you can take it and learn from it, it can really return exactly. on itself the rest of your career. So that's great. All right. The last question I have for you here, Trudy, let's just say you got an elevator with a younger civil engineer early in their career and you got 30 to 40 seconds with that individual. What kind of career advice would you give them in 30 to 40 seconds to help them out? This is what I've told all of my hirees. Um, any, I can teach you engineering, but I can't teach you um, ethics and values. I mean, those things can't be taught. You got to come with, you know, good moral compass because anybody can learn engineering. Well, not anybody, but you know, you can you can teach engineering. You can't teach the basics. That's great. Awesome. All right. Well, Trudy Williams, we appreciate you giving us some of your time and spending some time with us on the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thanks so much, Trudy. Sure. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Trudy Williams. I always feel blessed when I get to spend some time with someone who's had such a long and storied career like Trudy. And that message about pushing yourself, I think, is so important and just something that we all need to do. Keep pushing ourselves, surround ourselves with the right people, and we can really grow in our career as engineers and as people. If you like the video, please consider subscribing here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.